there's a video that I've needed to do for some time. And I would like to just start this video by apologizing to one particular individual, Yehuda Shlomo. I should have made this much sooner. I have no excuse. All I can say is that I was quite worried. And to you, I apologize. To everyone else, hold on, because this is going to be something. Many of you remember that a long, a couple of years ago, 2019, I did a video on the air, the massacre that took place in Arizona, and the video on the group formerly known as Midnight Productions and the human trafficking that flowed forth and their connections to Zionist entities, white supremacist entities and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. What I have is more information along those lines that I would like to share with you. Now this new information I present to you, I present to you as it was presented to me, an affidavit by a man who witnessed some of what it is that I'm talking about here. Yehuda Shlomo has given me an affidavit testifying to everything that he has seen and has given me permission to use his real name. Yehuda has since left Arizona and gone somewhere else to, for his own safety. So let me just get right into this. It has long been suspected by people that there is some link between Child Protective Services and human trafficking. Nobody has been able to adequately prove anything. And in fact, as I researched it and learned more, which will be coming in a future video, most of it comes from conspiracy theory type blogs. Now, it is important to point out a few things that are that need to be clarified. Now, it is often said that Child Protective Services is a private company. This is not necessarily true. Child Protective Services in Florida is a private company. That much is publicly acknowledged. What is true is that the rest of these Child Protective Services, which go by different names in different states, are entities that have been delegated the task of performing the services of Child Protective Services. Meaning, while they themselves are not actually the government, the government does oversee what they do. This does not necessarily make them private companies. It is important to note that many charities perform the function that the government should be in these situations, and that in itself is very strange to me, as this is something very important that the government should be taking on itself. Now, it has long been said in unofficial ways that Child Protective Services in Arizona has been trafficking children. There are individuals who claim to have been trafficked and there are people who claim to see things. But I... But there is no 100% undeniable proof. There is a phenomenon that continually takes place that uh, many people did not think was, was true, didn't think that this actually happened, including uh, Yehuda Shlomo himself, until he saw it with his own eyes and then has put forward this 
affidavit. I will read to you what he has to say from his look into the situation. What I am about to read are his words directly, not mine. It is believed by many that Arizona's Child Protective Services is under the control of Midnight Productions. I did not believe this before, but I do now. If a family has a blonde-haired, blue-eyed child and they are under investigation, it is very likely such a child will be taken by Child Protective Services. Such a market exists for white families who want Aryan children. What I am reporting is not new, not a new claim. To openly proclaim this is a good way to get discredited. Arizona's Child Protective Services targets the poor. Something not well known is that Arizona's Child Protective Services is not a part of the government. CPS is employed by the state, but it is not a part of the state. Many women, mostly mothers, have said in many different ways no other public agency leaves victims and advocates more perplexed than Child Protective Services. The poor families, especially black families, are the ones harmed by CPS the most. Not just in Arizona, but throughout the United States. The CPS practice of removing or threatening to remove children from homes is not justifiable. The level of proof of abuse claims which CPS required to put forth is so minimal that it provides parents with almost no protection against discriminatory, prejudiced, or abusive exercise of power by CPS. Child Protective Services targets dissident families. This is why black families are forced to deal with CPS more than any other families. As the black population in America grows and more uncomfortable with the origins and ongoing colonial behavior of the United States of America, which they are direct victims of, the more black families become the target of CPS. CPS is effective in this regard because many social workers are black themselves. There's always been such a low evidence burden on CPS, giving them control over countless families. Children are kidnapped by CPS. This is a truth which is not allowed to be said. In cases where one of the parents is abusive and the other is seeking help from CPS, the parent seeking the help is usually the one who ends up under investigation. The kangaroo court rules that the CPS slash juvenile rules of conduct make it nearly impossible for the parent to defend him or herself, especially against such vague accusations placed on loving mothers, such as she knew or should have known or even the more common failure to protect, none of which constitutes a crime in any criminal system. Typically, it is a lose-lose situation for loving parents. The CPS juvenile court system is by design secretive, wealth-based, white-controlled, and abusive. There are four instances in the city of Phoenix, Arizona, which are similar to each other. There are many more instances I have heard of, but I will only bring up four instances of which I was eyewitness to. All of these instances include Mexican woman in a car, which breaks down. In all four of the instances, there are children in the car and the mother tries to seek help for her broken down car. In all four of these instances, the mother is confronted by local police who just happened to be, have called a CPS social worker. All four of these events end the same way. The children are taken and coerced into a car with a white couple who promise to take care of the children until the mother is cleared of all suspicions. I am convinced that local law enforcement in Maricopa County is systemically anti-Mexican. There is a growing outcry by Native Americans to reclaim the lands of Arizona, California, and Texas, as well as the country of Mexico. The louder this outcry gets, the more Native Americans are targeted by law enforcement. The more Native outcry gets, the more Native Americans are targeted by uh, law enforcement. The more Native Americans and mixed Mexicans question the validity of Mexico, the United States, and Canada, the more they are targeted by police especially Latino American police with a good tan but are visibly Spanish and dominated in the facial features. Native Americans and mixed Mexicans are also very popular for consumers to watch rape films sold by Midnight Productions. These films are so popular among the customers that this genre of porn put out by Midnight Production is second only to the popularity of snuff films hacking transgender teens to death with big kitchen knives. Children taken by CPS often end up in videos put out by Midnight Productions. But the market for watching Mexican children get raped is becoming almost as popular as the snuff films involving the murder of transgender teenagers. I used to think that this was just a rumor, but I have the opposite position about this now. There's no doubt in my mind that Arizona's Child Protective Services is under the control of Midnight Productions. 
It is very hard to document this without confronting colonialism, but I will try to make this as professional as possible. There are now four instances with CPS which I document here in this affidavit. I am eyewitness to all four of these events. I hope this raises awareness. That was his portion of the document and he does outline some instances here which uh, I will I will give him in his exact words so that there is no misunderstanding and I will begin those now. March 3rd, 2018. I was walking up to the Valley Luna restaurant with a date, but we ended up cop watching instead. We were in the Bell West Plaza. The Val Luna restaurant I am making mention of is very popular. It is located at the corner of West Bell Road and North 35th Avenue, 3336 West Bell Road, Phoenix, Arizona, 85053. Me and my date were walking over to the Val Luna restaurant. I don't know for sure what time it was, but had to have been between 11.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. Behind us, from somewhat of a distance, we heard an explosion. At one of the driver's entranceway, a car broke down. In the car was a Mexican woman with a young, young girl in the back seat. She made a call on her cell phone demanding whoever it was on the other end of the phone pay up because she had not received any child support. My date walked over. I was hesitant, but I followed. Six cop cars came over very quickly and detained the woman. Out of one of the cars, a white woman and a white man came out with an Asian policewoman. Out of one of the cars, a well-dressed, manicured woman stepped out with a Latino policeman. The well-manicured, well-dressed woman shook hands with the white man who was next to the white woman. The well-dressed and well-manicured woman shook the hand of the cop who had detained the woman in her car, and I heard her say, I'm with Child Protective Services, and the policeman said, Nice to meet you. I was hoping you could unburden me. Her reply was, not a problem, officer. I do this every day. She then lowered herself to the eye level of the young girl and said, I have a new family for you. Would you like to meet them? The girl screamed, Mommy, Mommy, reaching for her mother, who was in the back of the police car. The policeman grabbed the girl by the neck and told her, This is for your own safety, and she was given to the white couple. The girl and the white couple went into one of the police cars, which they which left very quickly. I turned to my date and said, this is unreal. He looked at me rather disgusted and said, this is Arizona. Where are you from? When I tried to tell him that I was actually born in Arizona, he scoffed. He could not believe me. So after this event, I offered to drive him home. He accepted my offer. When I look back at this moment, I too would have been disgusted with me. I know what Arizona is. This event reminded, remained in my mind as an isolated event. June 6, 2020. In Arizona, a lot of Panther Code members had come out to be involved in waves of radicalism which were all over the place. This compelled me to go back to Arizona again, which I would have done because the events of May 27, 2019 made me want to stay away from Arizona forever. Besides, the majority of eyewitnesses who saw what happened in 2019 were black, which by itself makes the account of what happened seem unreliable to most authorities in Arizona. But I did come back to Arizona at the date of May 30th, 2020. How could I not? On the day May 25th, 2020, Dion Johnson, a black man in his late 20s, was killed in Phoenix, Arizona. This happened on the exact same date as the murder of George Floyd, so I had to go back to Arizona June 6th, 2020, was a day which I can never forget. I'm not sure of the time of day, but it would have been around 9 a.m. for sure. I was driving... I was on the road 19th Avenue and Northern. A car broke down in front of my car, so I went out of the car to see if I could help. In the car, there was a woman with three sons. I helped her get to the nearest gas station. She was wearing a mask, so was I. So were her three boys, and she had her three boys were all Mexicans. As we come to the gas station, a CPS social worker woman comes up to us and said, Hello, I am from Child Protective Services. And the Mexican woman asks, What do you want with me? As this happened, I was approached by two policemen who aggressively came in front of me and said, I, saying that I had to stand very still. They arrested the woman on the charge of child abuse, and the social worker took the three boys away. I was then questioned for two hours as to how I knew the woman. 
I explained each time that I did not even know her name or the names of the three boys. I just wanted to help her out. Both of the cops were white. One of the cops told me after seeing my driver's license that I was doing a disservice to the Jewish race by not moving back to Israel. When I told him that I was not from Israel, he threatened to arrest me. So then I had to apologize and admit I am from Israel. I also promised to move back as soon as COVID-19 was over. This event taught me that these events with CPS discrimination against Mexican women are very real. I looked as far into this as I could during the following days. I found out there was a demand for Mexican children in porn. As repulsive as this sounds, this is normal everyday stuff, a matter of reality for the poor in Arizona. They are expected to accept such a reality. They have no say in what happens to their children, especially if they are Mexican parents with Mexican children. This is during the time when Panther Code was slowly removing their presence from Arizona, eventually leaving behind only Black Minister 13 and King KJ. I was at 35th Avenue in Dunlap. I was at the infamous Cortez Park. I was going to be meeting with the Arizona Rebellion. I wanted to understand their point of view on certain matters. A green minivan was driving away. It broke down as it was driving away from the parking lot. Then a cop showed up a little more than five minutes later. Two policemen came out of the car and forced a woman out of the car and they pulled a boy and a girl out of the van. This was a very aggressive scene. The woman and the, the boy and the girl were all Mexicans. One of the cops was white and the other cop was black. Two CPS social workers came and greeted the cops. One of them was a man, the other was a woman. I was in shock by this because the man said, Hello officers, we are from Child Protective Services, as he reached out his hand for the cop to shake. The black cop shook his hand rather firmly. Some background to this must be given. I was in Las Vegas sometime during February 2020. I saw an alt-right demonstration some kind, and I, of some kind, and I saw a JDL man with a National Socialist Movement woman. I first saw the JDL man in January 2018 just outside the cosmopolitan Jewish Reconstructionist community of Phoenix, Arizona. The NSM woman that I first saw was in California on June 16, November, uh, June 16 and November 2017 in two pro-Trump rallies. I saw both the JDL man and the NSM woman together February 2020 in Las Vegas, Nevada. Both of them were right there greeting the police. CPS social workers. This is when I finally realized that it is highly unlikely that Midnight Production is not controlling Arizona's Children Protective Services. I no longer think that this is a this rumor is a rumor. It is much more of a fact. The two social workers told the Mexican boy and Mexican girl to stay with them until their new parents arrived. The cops came over to me. I was told to leave or I would be arrested. So I got in my car and drove away. I did not meet the Arizona Rebellion that day. I began to think about the event and the two similar events. It is always a Mexican woman with her kids. There is always cops which show up very quickly. The new family always seems to be white. This is this time I saw a Zionist and a Nazi together. I had seen them together before, but now all of a sudden there are CPS social workers. I got to meet the Arizona Rebellion a few days later. They told me that the cops sabotage the vehicles of single Mexican women because when the vehicle breaks down, it can be said that the heat will cause the children or child to possibly become dehydrated, which in Arizona is cause for calling CPS. When I asked them why do the cops do this in the first place, the Arizona Rebellion told me this is where Midnight Productions gets most of the Mexican kids they use for their rape films. One of the members of the Arizona Rebellion was a Mexican survivor of Midnight Productions. I asked him where his mother was. He told me that he that she was last seen hooking for blues. Blues is slang for blue-colored fentanyl pills, often mixed with black heroin. I learned that his mother only got hooked on drugs after she went homeless. She went homeless spending all of her money trying to fight the courts to get her son back. Late September 2022. This is one of the worst days I've ever experienced in Arizona. I've been on, the, I've been on the run for quite a few days. I was helping the notorious pink purple girl. She started filming police crimes. She is still, fr she is still is from what I hear. And I'm proud to mention that I am the one who bought her the camera. She has recorded incredible police footage of police doing many nefarious things. 
I covered as much of Maricopa County with her as my sanity would allow. We lost track of the days. I brought her to her hideout. I bid her farewell and went to a gas station to, to fill up my almost empty tank. With a tank full of gas in my car, I decided to get back to the apartment I was renting. I came back to an eviction notice. I had one more month of rent to pay, but I had kept procrastinating the payment. I don't really plan on staying in Arizona. This is my mindset every time I'm in Arizona, no matter how long I just happen to be staying there. I decided to go to a motel. I decided to stay the night at the motel, and as soon as I woke, I brushed my teeth and took a shower. I got dressed and checked out and drove away. I drove to 2120 East Cactus Road, Phoenix, Arizona, 85022. I had my breakfast paid, then went outside back into my car. As I walked to my car, it happened again. I did not see a car break down this time, but I could see the smoke coming from the front of the car. There was a Mexican woman on the phone. She had with her a very young Mexican boy who could not have been older than five. I realized what was going to happen, so I decided to help her, just so I figured out what was going to happen, going to happen so they could be prevented. I approached her, asked her if she needed or could need a ride. She thanked me and said she was very grateful. Then a cop car pulled up. A black limousine pulled up next to the cop car. Coming out of the limousine was a short white woman. Then two policemen in the cop car came out of the car. The cops were both white. The older policeman asked to see my driver's license. I told him that he had no probable cause. And then the younger policeman tackled me to the ground. As I looked up, the boy was grabbed by the older policeman and given to the short white woman. The black limousine drove away slowly. A crowd gathered around us as I was arrested. As I was being shoved into the cop car, I could hear the older policeman say to the Mexican woman, show up to the courthouse on this date and he handed her a note of some kind. She was crying the entire time. I don't think she understood what was happening. The older policeman joined his partner in the car. They drove me up and down Cactus Road. I said nothing the entire time. Then I was dropped off back at 2120 East Cactus Road, Phoenix, Arizona, 850-022, right in front of my car. As I stepped back into my car, the older cop said to me with his window rolled down, We are watching you, Mr. Slomo. Before I could say anything, he spoke again. Everything you have come to know, we already know. The law is on our side. And then the cop car shrieked off. If the Mexican woman was handed a genuine legal summons, then it would have had to have been issued in advance. This leads me to believe that these events were well coordinated by the state. Arizona is totalitarian. There's no doubt about this. I've spoken to many individuals who have seen this type of event happen. A car driven by a Mexican woman breaks down right away. A cop car, possibly more than one cop car, shows up immediately. Then... A white CPS social worker arrives, sometimes accompanied by a white family who have come to assume guardianship of a single Mexican mother's child. This is normal life in Arizona, and nobody likes to talk about it. But that is the end of his statement there. He then proceeds to discuss the kidnapping of a woman that he knows, who was kidnapped earlier this year. This is the story of the kidnapping of Eden Moreau. Time and date, 12.45 p.m., March 12, 2023. Location, 35th Avenue and Bell Road. It is believed that Henry Station was behind the kidnapping of Eden Moreno. Henry Station is the boyfriend of Eden Moreno. Henry Station is five is five feet tall, medium build, white man in his late twenties. Ina Morano was with three other individuals when she was kidnapped in a parking lot in front of a Safeway grocery store. Henry Station is believed to be a part of Midnight Productions. It is also believed that Henry Station is an alias. Eden Moreau was with three other individuals during this event. They all told me they saw a man approach them. The man grabbed Eden by the throat. He was not alone. One of the individuals maintained that there were five men. One of them thinks that there was only three. One of them is not sure. One of the individuals claimed to have recognized the man who was grabbing Eden by the throat as one of the friends of Henry Station. The recognized man is six foot two, gray hair. Two eyewitnesses say his eyes were green, but one eyewitness is unsure of this and thinks that they were brown. 
All three eyewitnesses describe him as a mixed Caucasian, also having a distinctly circular face. Eden Moreau, after seeing Eric Grodsky on the Dr. Wessel Show, wanted to join the JPLO because Eric Grodsky described himself as Jewish and Muslim. Eden Moreau considers herself Jewish and Christian. Eden Moreau is well known for promoting Buddhism over Zionism. Eden Moreau is also very well known for opposing Messianic Judaism. Jews for Jesus. Uh, Chabad Lobovich. The Jewish Buddhist diaspora movement rejected any concept of Jewish Christians and Jewish Muslims. But it was recognized within the Jewish Boon diaspora movement that, that a Christian or Muslim could have Jewishness, depending on how such a person had been cultured. However, having Jewishness did not make one Jewish. As the three individuals who were with Eden Moreau tried to protect her, a policeman came forward from behind them and told them to lay face flat on the ground. Eden Moreau could be seen being dragged into a white van by her throat and hair. One of the eyewitnesses has vowed to find Eden Moreau. A search has begun for her. That is the end of the statement by Yehuda Shlomo. It has turned out that Henry Station is in fact a member of Midnight Productions. And that to this day Eden Moreau has not been found. It is highly suspected that Eden Moreau might have been on to Midnight Production, and which is why she ended up disappearing. This is all the information that Yehuda Shlomo was able to give me before he had to leave. He has since left Arizona, gone to another state, and gone into hiding. There is much more that someone can find when they begin searching into the history of CPS and the allegations of human trafficking. Something that I hope to take on more of in the future as I, can, as I perform more research along these lines. Until that time, I wanted to get this statement by Yehuda Shlomo out there. He specifically gave me this affidavit with his real name and permission to use his real name in order to get this information out. And I have had this information for some time and was really going over what was the best way to present it. I want to Thank you for watching. I hope that you can take this information to heart and keep it in mind. Hopefully raise some awareness. And if you do happen to live in Arizona, please be very careful. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, Comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.